Do you think physics has anything us anything to tell us about the meaning of our existence? A small question, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I think there's two ways you can look at that question. The first is what would be a traditional safe answer. And that is that, you know, since uh, Copernicus, physics and astronomy have been showing us how vast the universe is and how small our place is in it. And in that sense, it has reduced uh, our importance in a very meaningful way. And that is to let us see that, you know, there's a vast universe going, uh, uh, going on out there all the time. You know, now we're understanding that there's, you know, uh, billions of planets. Um, and that our role in this is not so important that perhaps we should see ourselves at the center of the universe, which, you know, is either comforting or not comforting, depending on how you look at it. But it was a very important um, ontological discovery. The second way is perhaps a little bit, you know, more controversial or less safe, and it's really that this is the open question for me, is that we still don't really understand what um, the role of the, uh, in some sense, where to put the observer in, uh, in physics. Um, and so and even, I mean this even in the sense of you can ask, in some sense, are we the universe's way of looking back at itself? And so, depending on how strongly you take that, there's one way you can take it that's just sort of poetry, that's very sweet, where the, you know, where the universe gazing upon itself and, uh, you know, when consciousness came into being. Or you could take it in a more deep level, which is that in some sense, you know, there's no, we never have an experience of the world outside of ourselves. So talk about, you know, objective reality is a beautiful and useful um, uh, mythology, but nobody's ever had an experience of it. And so there, maybe there's a way in which somehow, you know, if we can't get out of our perspective uh, or, or the, um, uh, the, the, this, this, this perfect view, uh, the ideal of the perfect view of objective reality. Maybe that meaning, when we came into the world, meaning truly came into the world. Okay, Tim, let, let me jump to you. You are our resident philosopher on the <laughs> panel here. W what about this question of meaning? Can, can physics help us out at all? Um, well, you, you expressed it in several different ways. And so one way was, what's our place in the universe? Where did we come from? That, those are obvious questions that have scientific answers in terms of the evolution and the size of the, you know, where we are located in the cosmos. So sure, if that's what you're after, uh, obviously there are scientific answers to that. Which if, is, which is it, not it's, very it's, helpful it's, to us. It's, well, it, we're, we're insignificant if in that people, sense. Well, no, I don't, I don't know why that makes us insignificant. I mean, I don't think it has any bearing on our significance one way or another, because we're small. OK, I mean, you know, we're big compared to little things. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, I'm really big compared to an atom. Should I feel good about that? I mean, look, um, if, you're, if you're asking the question, am I spending my life well? Am I leading a good human life? Am I doing something that can be defended as, as a good thing or to do? Um, I think those are perfectly good questions. I don't think physics is going to bear on them one way or the other. And if you think that they do, then you're misunderstanding the questions. That's not to say that physics is telling you they don't Th th those aren't good questions to ask, but physics isn't the place to go for an answer to them. Now, if you thought to have a meaningful life, the world had to look pretty much like it does in Genesis, that the earth was made at the center and all the other animals were made and then humans were made at the top and the men were put over the women. And if you're a man, oh boy, I'm really sitting right here at the top. Um, yeah, you're out of luck, right? That's not what happened. <laughs> um, Live with it, right? I mean, you better get a different picture of what, what, you know, how to structure your life, because that one's just based on a myth. But beyond that, I, 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 I do think these things come apart a, a, a bit. And I, I might even say, if you want to bring consciousness in, you'll notice what happened. You bring consciousness in, but then it's us. I mean, lots of things are conscious, you know. Um, we're we're so. going to come back to these questions about <laughs> consciousness, I'm quite sure. Uh, Priya, how do you deal with this question of, of meaning within the, the world of physics? Well, so first of all, I concur with Tim that we cannot look to physics to answer all parts of what uh, reality means and what reality is. But I also want to echo what Adam said, which is that the perspective from which we are actually viewing and addressing this question is important. And what I mean by that is whether we see ourselves as significant or as insignificant does have a bearing. And I think we're at a very interesting uh, time in terms of our knowledge of the cosmos because we are insignificant in the sense that you know we are but one planet, we're this one pale blue dot, and so on and so forth. However, as far as we know to date, 
we're the only advanced civilization that's out here that has um, controlled this planet and its resources and constructed the kind of intellectual legacy and has discovered all these things about the universe. So I think this sort of attention, if you will, in figuring out our place. So we are significant and yet insignificant. So, so the significance comes because we might be the only intelligent life in, in the universe. And um, you know, uh, only intelligent life that is cognitively as capable as we have been in terms of figuring out the properties of the material universe the way we have. D Dave, wh what's your take on some of these questions? Well, thank you for uh, seating me first and asking me last. So I appreciate that, Steve. Thank you. Um, so I can say they're all right, and uh, but I do—I mean, I do find myself nodding in, 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 I think, increasingly vigorous agreement with with uh, the panelists here. Um, and, I, and maybe just pick up, if I wear my historian's cap for a moment, part of why I personally um, have some uh, cautions before making maybe uh, a leap from uh, glorious studies of the early universe to we now have lessons for you know human nature or, or how we live our lives today, is that you know we many many very smart and very earnest and very well-meaning people uh, who would have sat in panel very much like this over the last several hundred years, uh, have many of them have been convinced that there is, uh, uh, there are lessons to be learned about what it is to lead our lives in a good and meaningful way from close studies of nature. And they've used those to justify, uh, in their minds, uh, opinions that I would find, uh, and I think all of us would find today, completely disgusting, abhorrent, and, and frightening. And so if, so the efforts to, to, to glean that kind of meaning, how do we live the good life today, how do we organize society, what does it mean to, to be caring and nurturing, whatever else we might hold up as laudable, um, the, the number of times people have tried and done that to our modern eyes very poorly is a long, long, and very sad list, and not only in the far away and, and distant past, even well into the 20th century. What, what, what are some of those abhorrent ideas? Oh, there's, there's unfortunately long traditions of scientifically backed racism, so-called scientifically, or you know, uh, eugenics, uh, social Darwinism of many kinds, uh, which have sort of echoes in some areas uh, even today, but were, were to our modernized blatant and, and sort of drips off the page, if you go back, not that far into the past. So the effort to kind of glean a kind of ultimate meaning in the sense of human affairs, how to live the good life, how to organize society, to think that there are unique lessons to be had from nature that can then be applied has unfortunately not always worked out so well for lots of people. And it also seems to, that both, I think is something else maybe Tim and, and Adam were both saying, um, both studying the universe that we're in uh, and trying to figure out how to lead a good life and how to organize society, those are both really big challenges. Uh, I don't think we have answers to either of those. So why make, why make smush together two really big open hard questions <laughs> and, and, and make even more room for error? So that's, that's the reasons yeah. for historical okay. caution. Uh, Tim? Yeah, can I just give a, a, a really short story about Because, I mean, there's both the science and then there's science as a source of metaphor, which is even right. a different thing. So I had a, a, a colleague who was interested both in especially quantum physics and modern science and in mystical traditions. And at one point I was having a conversation with her. He said, well, the entanglement in quantum mechanics shows us that the universe is one unbroken whole. And that tells us we should all you know, care for each other and love, for, love each other. And I said, so if Newton had turned out to be right, then we could go around killing each other and it would be OK. And she said, no, 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 that's not what I mean. right?" But, but that means she didn't really think that these ethical conclusions followed from the physics. She was just grabbing on to pieces of the physics to metaphorically illustrate, which, which is perfectly good ethics. But I, you, know, you shouldn't think that it's a derivation or you're going to get in trouble because the physics can go any way that you don't know where it's going to go. 